My name is Vanessa Shakib, and I co-direct Advancing Law for Animals. We are a nonprofit law firm for our non-human friends, and we focus on issues impacting animals in research, as well as farmed animals. Our work is primarily litigation-based, meaning we primarily file lawsuits and see them through to their conclusion. Although we also do regulatory work with United States federal agencies, and in this presentation, I'll speak a little bit more about what that means. So tonight, I'm speaking about US legal trends impacting animals. But since this is an international crowd, and we all call a different place home and have different systems of government, I'd like to provide some context for the legal landscape that I'll be discussing. So before we dive into the trends, I'm going to offer a brief overview of our structure of government in the United States, which will give a better understanding of the legal landscape that we're going to be surveying. So the United States Constitution provides for a separation of powers, which gives us three separate branches of government. The first branch of government is the legislative branch, and that's made up of Congress. Our Congress is bicameral, meaning there's two houses, the Senate and the House of Representatives. Uh, the Congress makes and passes laws at the federal level. So federal laws are laws that are applied nationally across all 50 states. Next, we have the executive branch, which is made up of the president and the president's cabinet, as well as vice president. Uh, the president has the ability to veto laws passed by Congress, although there are limits on the veto power. And the president also has the ability to issue executive orders. And these are legal directives with the force of law. Uh, but like veto powers, the ability to issue executive orders also is subject to certain limits. And finally, we have the judicial branch. And the judicial branch is made up of our court system. And our court system interprets and applies the laws that we have in our country. Our highest court is called the United States Supreme Court. And beneath the Supreme Court are other lower federal courts. And the opinions issued by the United States Supreme Court uh, are given precedent and applied over other lower courts. So when we think about the legal landscape and what legal trends are impacting animals, we need to look at actions coming out of the legislative branch. We need to look at actions by the executive. And we also need to look at opinions from the court system. But there's one other place we need to look. We need to consider the role of federal agencies. Now, what is a federal agency? So in the United States, as we talked about, Congress and the legislative branch passes laws. Now, these laws can often be very broad, and so federal agencies give them meaning by interpreting these laws into regulations, which give meaning to that broader mandate. Also, in certain laws, Congress may expressly give federal agencies the ability to pass certain kinds of regulations to enact Congress's intent. So it turns out that if we're looking at legal trends, we definitely need to keep an eye on federal agencies, which are incredibly influential. In fact, some political scientists and legal scholars speculate that federal agencies in the United States effectively make up the fourth branch of government because of how incredibly influential they are in their ability to pass regulations. So if federal agencies are so influential, exactly how many are there? 
Well, interestingly enough, the Administrative Conference of the United States uh, prepared a source book of United States executive agencies, and this provides three different citations for how many federal agencies we have. This ranges from 78 to 137, so that is a head scratcher. We don't know exactly how many federal agencies we have in the United States, um, apparently anywhere from 78 to 137, uh, but luckily for the purposes of this conversation, we'll be keeping our eye on only two. That is the United States Department of Agriculture, the USDA, as well as the Food and Drug Administration, the FDA. The next factor we need to think of when we look at legal trends impacting animals is the interaction of different levels of law. So if you take a look here at this image, you see at the bottom level we have local laws and these are laws passed in cities, counties, towns, and municipalities. Above that, we have state laws, and these are the laws that apply in our 50 states. And up top, we have United States federal law. Now, these again are those national laws that apply to all states countrywide. And so, when we look at all the different levels of law that we have, the question comes, which law gets priority? And we have something called the principle of preemption of federal law, and that means that where a federal law and a state law conflict, generally speaking, it's the federal law that trumps and is given priority. That's called preemptive effect. So summarizing what we've learned from our structure of government, if we want to take a look at legal trends impacting animals, we're going to be looking in a couple places. We're going to be looking at state law. We're also going to be looking at US federal law and those regulations passed by United States federal agencies. And we're also going to look at other federal agency actions. And so. When we consider all of these areas of the legal landscape together, and we look at what trends pop out, there's three that I'd like to share with you today that we're gonna go over. Certainly, there's many more, but my time with you tonight is limited. So we're gonna talk first about the unfortunate decline in the enforcement of the Federal Animal Welfare Act. We're gonna talk about the increase in state post-research adoption laws. And finally, we're also gonna talk about the increase in federal and state actions to limit the labeling on plant-based food products. So let's get started. The first thing that we're gonna talk about is the decline in enforcement of the Animal Welfare Act or the AWA. Now, before we dive in to what that looks like, let's talk about what the Animal Welfare Act is. Now, again, this is a federal law, so thinking back to the triangle, this is at the top, and the Animal Welfare Act is a federal law regulating the treatment of animals in research, exhibition, transport, and by dealers. So that means it's applying to animals in laboratories, animals in exhibition like roadside zoos and circuses, and animals being bred. So that can be animals bred for research. It can also be uh, dogs and cats bred in what we call puppy mills in intensive confinement, very much like factory farming. Among other shortcomings, the AWA excludes rats and mice, which comprise the majority of animals in research, and it also excludes farmed animals. Now, a quick note, you may ask, well, how many animals are regulated per year under the Animal 
Welfare Act. And the truth is we don't have an exact number and that's because there's differences in annual reporting requirements across the kinds of animals. So we know that for animals in research covered by the Animal Welfare Act per year, there's about one million. But because coverage of the AWA does not apply to rats and mice in research, and rats and mice comprise the bulk of research about 90%, that means the majority of animals in research in the United States are not covered by the Animal Welfare Act, and we don't know exactly how many animals in research are being used in laboratories. As for the other categories of animals, we don't have exact numbers on those, but if we, for example, just consider puppy mills, um, estimates are that a few million puppy mills are bred each year. Uh, in these highly confined environments. So although, although we don't know precisely, the AWA is governing millions of animals per year. So the trend that I'm gonna talk with you about is the unfortunate downward trend in AWA enforcement. So who enforces the AWA? Well, that's that federal agency we talked about earlier, the United States Department of Agriculture. The USDA has an animal care department with inspectors, and those inspectors go out and they perform inspections at facilities which have licenses under the Animal Welfare Act. And when a facility is violating the law, inspectors should be citing those facilities for their violations and calculating penalties. But like I said, we're seeing a downward trend in enforcement. So what exactly does that mean? Well, unfortunately, it means citations are down. It means that penalties are down. And it also means that we are seeing this trend of so-called education over enforcement, which is basically some fancy dressing for business over animals. Now, it's not just animal advocates that are concerned by this unfortunate downward trend in enforcement. In fact, even the United States Department of Agriculture's Office of Inspector General is likewise concerned about its enforcement. In 2010, the OIG performed an audit of USDA's inspection of large-scale problematic dog breeders, what we all call puppy mills, and the findings of the audit were quite bothersome. Here's some direct quotes. First, the audit found the enforcement process was ineffective against problematic dealers. Also found inspectors did not cite or document violations properly to support enforcement. Further found that inspectors misused guidelines to lower penalties for AWA violators. And finally, the audit found that USDA believed that compliance achieved through education and cooperation would result in long-term dealer compliance. But relying heavily on education weakened the agency's ability to protect animals. Again, this audit came out in 2010. And so what has the USDA done since 2010? Do we think the USDA picked up enforcement? No, sadly, no. Um, so the USDA hasn't picked up its enforcement, and it's actually maintained this supposed approach of education over enforcement with the issuance and implementation of two very problematic rules, the teachable moments rule and the self-reporting rule. So these rules are in the vein of the so-called philosophy, again, of education over enforcement, AKA business over animals, and under the teachable moments rule, when certain licensees violate the Animal Welfare Act, 
instead of getting a write-up on the inspection report or a citation, poof, those instances can be written off as mere teachable moments. And similarly, when it comes to the self-reporting rule, if an AWA licensee merely coughs up to the USDA that it broke the law ahead of an inspection, then poof, again, that violation is non-consequential. Now, when it comes to teachable moments, the USDA's own criteria states that teachable moments will not be used in instances impacting animal welfare. But do you think that the USDA applies that criteria? No, unfortunately, no. Our client Stop Animal Exploitation Now, uh, as well as other animal advocates, have been able to obtain records from the USDA to understand when teachable moments are used. Um, and in the case of records obtained by our client, Stop Animal Exploitation Now, these documents demonstrate that teachable moments are used in the context of animals and research in situations which do impact animal welfare, and in one instance even led to the death of a pig used in research. So again, it's not just the public, and it's not just animal advocates, and it's no longer just the USDA OIG taking issue with teachable moments and this so-called philosophy of education over enforcement. In fact, in 2017, bipartisan members of Congress wrote to the USDA OIG saying, in essence, things haven't gotten any better since your 2010 report, and we need a follow-up. If this is your um, issue area, I strongly recommend reading this letter in full because it's very powerful, but I'd like to share with you one passage. These members of Congress write, evidence has shown that USDA animal care has lapsed back into behavior that the 2010 OIG report identified as ineffective and counterproductive to enforcing the Animal Welfare Act for commercial dog breeders. Specifically, USDA Animal Care is emphasizing education over enforcement with a new protocol referred to as teachable moments. So this is all, this is very troubling and it's troubling to us at Advancing Law for Animals. So we very recently sued the USDA uh, over the use of the teachable moments rule and the self-reporting rule. And, thank you. We sued the USDA on behalf of Stop Animal Exploitation Now, as well as Missouri Alliance for Animal Legislation. And again, our goal is to get an order from the court saying that the teachable moments rule and the self-reporting rule cannot be applied. Now, why is that? So I don't wanna get into this super boring legal mumbo jumbo, but um, the quick summary is, uh, back a couple slides when we talked about federal agencies and their ability to pass legislative rules or binding regulations, uh, these agencies, they don't just get to do whatever they want, they have to follow a very specific procedure. And in the case of the teachable moments rule and the self-reporting rule, we're alleging that they did not follow that procedure as they were obligated to by law. And as a result, these rules are defective. And as a result, they simply cannot be applied. So this litigation is currently pending. I don't have any report for you, but I truly hope to come back next year and have good news on our progress. The next trend that I'm gonna discuss with you is the increase in state post-research adoption laws. So what is a post-research adoption law? You may have heard of it uh, referred to as a Beagle Freedom Law, thanks to the incredible work of the Beagle Freedom Project in getting these state laws passed. Uh, but post-research means after research, 
So these laws allow for the adoption of research animals, granted certain species of research animals, after their use if they are suitable for adoption. Now, post-research adoption laws are very important for a couple of reasons. First, animals who have lived their entire lives inside cages and haven't experienced grass or sunshine or the love of a family um, actually have a shot at a forever home. But also, these laboratory survivors act as community ambassadors. So when a loving home accepts a laboratory survivor, other people in the household and other people in the community who may not have resonated with uh, the issues that animals and research face suddenly may come to think of it differently after meeting and falling in love with a laboratory survivor. So um, we love these laws and we love the fact that right now they are passed uh, and they exist in about nine states in the United States. So that's super exciting and the list is behind me uh, along with the legal citation and if you'd like those citations, feel free to email me and I'm happy to pass them on. So aside from the fact that we have many already existing, we also have about eight more pending. What that means is these are somewhere along in the state legislative process. They haven't been passed. They haven't been rejected. Uh, we just, we don't know yet, still baking. So again, hopefully next year, uh, there's gonna be good news about all of these laws passing. But again, these are state laws. So if we think back to a few slides earlier to that triangle I showed you with the federal law on top and the state law in the middle, you may rightfully be asking yourself, well, do these laws count if there are state laws and if there's already a federal law uh, pertaining to animals and research? And the answer is absolutely yes. Um, so in this case, the Federal Animal Welfare Act actually just sets a floor for the treatment of the animals it governs. It doesn't set a ceiling, and it expressly allows for states to enact further protection for animals. So here, the Federal uh, Animal Welfare Act does not prohibit post-research adoption. And so if a state passes a post-research adoption law, that is valid and that is enforceable, and it can, should, and must coexist with federal law. So it's super exciting that we have so many and that hopefully we'll have so many more. And I don't wanna to get too deep into the weeds, but I wanted to just go over a couple of them just to show you that while these laws are largely very similar, they also have some variation. So all of these laws only apply to dogs and cats. And in the state of California, the law applies to a public post-secondary educational institution, as well as independent institutions of higher education. And they apply uh, at the conclusion of research if the animal is suitable for adoption and if the educational institution does not have a process for adopting out that animal, then that educational institution shall offer the dogs or cats to an animal adoption organization or rescue organization prior to euthanization. So this is the law in California, and let's just quickly compare that to Maryland. So Maryland, again, like all the other laws, it only applies to dogs and cats, but if you look at the top, it applies to research facilities. And this law actually defines research facilities very broadly to include higher education research facilities, scientific research facilities, medical research facilities, and product testing facilities. So as we can see, the Maryland law has broader application than the California law. Nonetheless, both of these laws have many similarities. Like I said, we are so happy to see these laws and we're happy to see more states introducing them and passing them. Um, but there is some issue 
with enforcement. We're not seeing a lot of data as to how and to what extent these laws are being applied. Now, why is that? So, backing up a couple slides when we talked about the Animal Welfare Act. The Animal Welfare Act is the federal law governing animals and research. So, when a research facility wants to propose any sort of research on animals uh, to the committee for approval, federal law sets out a checklist of all of the items that that research facility needs to include in its application. But these federal regulations don't expressly require approval committees reviewing animal experiments to consider state adoption requirements. So in other words, as these facilities are going down, check, check, check their federal list of criteria on their application, there's no express requirement that they state the existence of a post-research adoption law, for example, for example uh, and its efforts to comply. So because there's this lack of coordination and centralized enforcement, um, we're unsure as to what extent these laws are being applied. So what's our solution? Uh, advancing Law for Animals submitted to the United States Department of Agriculture on behalf of itself, as well as the New England Anti-Vivisection Society, a petition for rulemaking. Uh, in the United States, citizens are able to interact with federal agencies. We're allowed to petition that agency to promulgate uh, new federal regulations. So in our case, we petitioned the USDA for federal regulations coordinating with state post-research adoption laws, and we make it super easy. We pre-wrote our proposed regulations, and these proposed rules would require research facilities to plan adoption when submitting proposed experiments for approval. Now, right now, uh, our petition has been submitted and it's being reviewed, and the agency has two options. The agency can publish our proposed rules for public notice and comment, which is that first step in official rulemaking, or the agency can say, eh, denied. But in that case, the agency needs to state its reasons for denial, and at that point, if the reasons for denial are arbitrary or capricious, those are legal terms of art, meaning not reasonable, we have the opportunity to litigate. So again, this is pending, and I hope to come back to you next year with some good news uh, and good updates on that petition for rulemaking. So the final trend that I'm going to discuss with you tonight is the increase in movement at both the federal level and the state level in restrictions on plant-based food labeling. So before we get into some of that action, I wanna offer a bit of background information because these proposed laws are not happening in a vacuum. So What's going on that suddenly we're seeing this uptake? Uptick, excuse me. So the Good Food Institute put together the market data on total US plant-based food market sales for years 2017 to 2019 in this super useful graphic. So here we can see that total US plant-based food sales in the United States uh, reach billions of dollars per year. And as you can see by those upward arrows, uh, it's going up and up and up each year. Similarly, the Plant-Based Food Association put together these really useful market, uh, these really useful graphics conveying the market data, uh, breaking down between plant-based milks as well as plant-based meats. So let's start on the left, well, 
my left, sorry guys. Um, so let's start with plant-based milks. We can see that in 2017 in the US, plant-based milks went up 3%, and in 2018, 9%, and relevant for this discussion, we see in 2018, cow's milk decreasing by 6% at that same time. Now if we move on over to plant-based meats versus animal meat, uh, we see a similar upward growth for plant-based meats. We're seeing in 2017 that 6% increase, and we're seeing in 2018, wow, jumping to 24%. Um, and that is in contrast to animal meats increasing 2% in 2018. So you don't have to be a mathematician to see that plant-based food sales are exploding in the United States and that particularly the animal-based dairy industry is really suffering. So with that in mind, let's talk about the response from government. And this is the subject of a whole other talk, but we will note that there appears to be, from the government's response, an entrenchment of government with animal agriculture. But nonetheless, like I said, that's a whole other talk. So let's take a look at the Food and Drug Administration. Now that's that federal agency that we talked about earlier. The Food and Drug Administration does a lot of things, but for purposes of this conversation, it's responsible for federal regulations that define the meaning of certain foods. So what's happening with the FDA? Well, in 2018, the FDA asked for public input on the use of the names of dairy foods in the labeling of plant-based products. So what does it mean when an agency is asking for public comment? That means that that federal agency is thinking about taking some kind of regulatory action or issuing a new regulation. And as part of that process, it's trying to get feedback both from the public as well as relevant stakeholders. So the FDA started this comment period on the use of words like milk, cheese, and yogurt in the context of plant-based foods. And more specifically, the FDA said that it was interested in learning how consumers use these plant-based products and how they understand terms like milk or yogurt when included in the names of plant-based products. They're also were very interested in knowing whether consumers know there's a difference in the basic nature, characteristics, ingredients, and nutritional content of plant-based products versus animal-based products. Now, this is a head scratcher, right? Because we know people are not buying almond milk because they think that it's cow's milk. In fact, people are buying almond milk because they know that it is not cow's milk. They want the environmental, the health, animal welfare benefits. They want all that good stuff. They absolutely know it's different. So again, this is a head scratcher, but nonetheless, we need to participate in the process. So advancing Law for Animals submitted an official regulatory response explaining what we all know. Hey, almond milk is not confusing. <laughs> and <laughs> of course, we couldn't just state the obvious. We had to include legal support for our claim. So first, we summarized what federal courts in the United States have unanimously already found about these plant-based products like almond milk, like soy milk. Now, you may be wondering, why are federal courts even talking about soy milk and almond milk in the United States? So a little bit of background. Um, in the US, we had a lot of very frivolous, very baseless, so-called consumer protection litigation where there were class action lawsuits against producers of plant-based milk products saying this exact thing that consumers are confused. 
Uh, if almond milk uses the word milk, it's deceptive, it's not truthful, it's misleading, it's an illegal business practice. So we saw several of these cases in federal court across the US and it's not a surprise that the judges all unanimously found the same thing. They all said, let's take a look, even unsophisticated consumers do not confuse plant-based milks with dairy-based milks. <laughs> Second, they found consumers do not assume plant-based milks have the same nutritional content as dairy-based milks. And finally, federal courts have found over and over names like almond milk accurately describe products in conformance with the governing regulations. We then went on to explain a little thing called the First Amendment, and that's something included in the United States Constitution, uh, which provides the right to freedom of speech. Now, this is an interesting fact. Labels and marketing material, including the labels and marketing material of plant-based dairy alternatives are commercial speech protected by the First Amendment. Now, commercial speech uh, is subject to a different standard than non-commercial speech under the First Amendment, but nonetheless, commercial speech is in fact protected by the First Amendment. And because of that, restrictions on commercial speech are disfavored, and they're only permitted when narrowly tailored to advance a substantial government interest. So we said, hey, there is no substantial government interest here because, as we all know, as the federal courts have said over and over and over, nobody is confused by almond milk. Now, if this wasn't enough, we also threw in reference to a 2017 executive order issued by President Donald Trump. Now, I've got to say that uh, in my work, President Trump's actions have never been helpful, but in this, <laughs> in this instance, this executive order is useful because it says that it's the policy of the United States to alleviate unnecessary regulatory burdens placed on the American people. So here, nobody's confused. We don't need further regulations on plant-based food products. They're absolutely burdensome on the people, but hey, also on businesses, including small businesses, and it's simply unnecessary and unwarranted. Now, we submitted our comment in response uh, to this comment period opened up by the FDA, but we also wanted to get other advocates involved in the regulatory process. We wanted as many comments in favor of plant-based labeling as possible. So in partnership with Farm Sanctuary, we decided to have a little fun, and we launched the Dear FDA We Can Read campaign. So this was a super fun awareness campaign and a super fun way to get people involved in the regulatory process. We asked people to take selfies with their favorite plant-based dairy alternatives, their favorite plant-based milks, yogurts, and cheeses, and we asked them to tag their favorite companies, to tag the FDA, and to say, dear FDA, banning words like almond milk are unnecessary and unconstitutional, we can read. So it ended up being super fun. We had Milkadamia participate as a business, and Milkadamia makes incredible macadamia nut-based plant milk, so delicious. Um, Jean Bauer from Farm Sanctuary participated, which was super fun. And of course, plant lovers across the United States participated, and as you can see, as did their non-human companions. So it was a super good time, and by the end of the comment period, over 7,000 people had submitted comments to the FDA. Now you may ask, wow, what, what was in all those 7,000 comments? My goodness. Well, luckily, the Plant-Based Food Association commissioned a study on all of these comments, reviewed all of them, and here are the findings. Out of the over 7,000 comments, over 
90% of them tell the FDA to allow plant-based alternatives to use dairy terms. So again, this is something that's still pending. Although the comment period is closed, FDA hasn't yet announced what, if any, action it's going to take in response to its inquiry unless and until the FDA takes any further action, then there are no issues with plant-based milk labels with respect to the FDA at the federal level. So right now, at least from the FDA, no news is good news. But at the same time, like we talked about all those different ways that we can have laws in all the different areas of the legal landscape, now we need to talk about what U.S. Senator Tammy Baldwin is up to. She is a she is a Democrat from the state of Wisconsin, which is a dairy state, and she introduced, actually reintroduced, the Dairy Pride Act. And this is a very similar push to make it uh, this push for federal legislation banning the use of words like milk, yogurt, and cheese by plant-based food products. Now, again, this law is pending. Um, it hasn't passed. Um, and so I don't have any report for you. Hopefully next year it'll be done, never to be seen again. But something else is happening because, like we said, there's different levels of law in the U.S. While this is pending at the federal level, different states have taken state law action to restrict the use of plant-based food labels, and we're seeing these laws pass in a handful of states, and litigation challenging those laws has already started. So, for example, in Arkansas, there is pending litigation over the legality of a law preventing plant-based meat products from using the word meat. In Mississippi, there is pending litigation over a law preventing plant-based meat companies from using the word meat. And over here in Missouri, we have a meaty court battle. Funny pun, not really. Um, and that's pending. And finally, the state of Louisiana just passed a law which limits the use of the word meat and milk by plant-based food companies. So this is all pending, and I want to give a shout out to the Animal Legal Defense Fund, as well as the Good Food Institute, and finally the ACLU, because they're out there litigating these cases uh, to protect the labels on plant-based food products. So I am out of time, so I just want to conclude with please stay in touch with me. Um, whatever trends you're seeing in your country, I'd love to know about it. Feel free to shoot me an email. And if you're interested in our work and you want to hear how does, where does it go from here, what's next, please follow us on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube for all of the updates. And with that, I will open the floor to questions.